Excellent. Um, so, uh, yes, if you'd like to just introduce yourselves um, in a few sentences, just who you are and uh, maybe maybe just a little about, about your experience in the space. Um, I shall start from my right. Stephen. Hi, I'm Steve Valley. Um, I'm a lawyer. You can tell by my accent that I'm from the United States. Um, and uh, my practice, I've been a trial lawyer and a litigator for uh, since first I told you right to wrote the white paper. Uh, uh, started out an interesting time in the practice of law with the couldn't use books, and you weren't allowed to use electronic research until you learned how to use the books. So I did both. It was a great time to start practicing. It was about 20 years ago. So sometimes I felt like I was in a, a Dickens novel, going to court and hearing Dr. Cook read my names of the cases and the status. But I was also the first person in my firm to have internet access. I had to explain what an email address was and why I needed one. And I had a, I had a mosaic browser. I was the first person to have an internet, uh, to have a, a, a web browser in my law firm. Um, and I've had a very traditional practice. I spent about a month in trial um, against um, your friends here in London Lloyd's in September, dealing with 40-year-old uh, insurance policies and telexes. But at the same time, I have um, sort of an amateur hacker as a kid. I taught myself to program on a TRS-80, uh, writing adventure games in BASIC. And I lost that, and I came back to it. And then about five years ago, I ended up uh, deciding I got to sort of uh, be in my bonnet about dispute resolution, and I ended up uh, developing um, a dispute resolution platform using uh, Ruby on Rails and um, a centralized database using Postgres, and I realized the problem with my database was trust. And I st started reading about, I, start, I was like, other lawyers out there must be interested in software. So I did a little Googling, and I ran across a fellow named Casey Coleman, uh, whom I'm sure some of you know, and he introduced me to blockchain. And I, I discovered Bitcoin, and I think it was Ripple, actually, independently. I was trying to figure out how to escrow money without holding it myself. And I kind of went down that rabbit hole. I still practice law, but I have clients who are trying to build uh, blockchain technology that uh, is legally compliant. I, I love what, uh, what Vinay and Rob and the Materium team are doing, the Internet of Agreements, the idea of actually baking in um, I think that the term, I tweeted it, what Vinay said was, um, do what you do, you, you do you wherever you are, and the software will figure out regulatory compliance. I think that's very, very cool. Um, I'm happy to talk about legal developments in the U.S. too if folks have questions, but that's who I am, and let me uh, pass the microphone. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Clive Friedman. I'm a barrister, an arbitrator, and a mediator in chambers called Three Veron Buildings. Uh, I've been interested in anything to do with IT for many, many years, and uh, uh, more recently, I've been very interested in blockchains, and in particular, uh, how one resolves disputes that arise because people are using blockchains and smart contracts, and the kind of arbitration systems one might, might need in order to be uh, to help people resolve those disputes. Hi, I'm Julian Chua. I'm a corporate transactions lawyer from Singapore. I've spent most of my career working in uh, frontier and developing jurisdictions, uh, which uh, anyone who spent time there will, let, will, will know is a trustless space. And so the, ex the excitement of really being involved in blockchain and uh, in, the, in the crypto environment as a solution to implement what, uh, as a practicing lawyer, I've been, the issues I've been uh, facing with all my career has been exciting. I spent the last year working in the space, uh, working on blockchain implementation projects as well as ICOs. So it's a, it's a good time to be in the space. Hello, I'm Adam Sanit. I'm a disputes lawyer at Norton Rose Fulbright. Uh, my background is as a banking lawyer and as a disputes lawyer. I'm also part of the fintech practice at Norton Rose Fulbright. That's been going for about five years and it's evolved through that time from cryptocurrency through to blockchain, uh, distributed ledger, uh, and that's a, a very active group now at Northern Rose Fulbright. Um, personally, I uh, bring to the group, uh, apart from my practice as a, a lawyer, uh, I also um, research and publish in other areas, including mathematics, medical statistics, um, open source system code in C++. So I try and provide a, a slightly different perspective to the to the group there. 
Thank you very much. <coughs> and I'm Christopher Ray, uh, Chief Legal Officer at Materium. Uh, and we're, everything we talk about today is what I do, so I won't say anything more right now. Um, so, uh, the conference topic is blockchains and world trade. Um, what, is, what is trade? What is business? Um, I think a way to frame this is that trade is the negotiation of uh, reciprocal promises that are enforceable. And obviously any lawyer is going to recognize that I'm giving a sort of coded legal analysis here of, uh, in terms of the law of contract. Um, but, I, but this is a legal panel and I think this is, this is a very helpful and not perhaps not intuitive um, to the general public, uh, not an intuitive way to, to look at what trade is, what business is. Um, so, you know, first negotiation. It can be, it can be, uh, it can be in in some kind of public forum or marketplace. Um, originally, it would be uh, local. Um, technology enables uh, you know, much more remote and perhaps larger scale um, marketplaces that may be more complex. Um, secondly. Um, reciprocal promises, what do I mean by that? Uh, I just mean that um, a trade is something where I do something for you and you do something for me. So I promise to give you a ton of wheat or to translate your document and you promise to give me 500. Thirdly, Thirdly um, these promises are enforceable, um, which means if I don't deliver your ton of wheat, or I don't competently translate your document by the deadline that we agreed, uh, then um, you're able to force me to compensate you for what you've lost as a result of that broken promise. So, so businesses are negotiated reciprocal promises that are enforceable. This is what trade is, and world trade just happens on a larger scale and across borders. Um, and as I said, technology has enabled that, communications technology, uh, transportation technology, um, legal technology, something like the idea of using arbitration. Um, now the people can agree that a uh, specific individual with certain kind of expertise um, will solve a dispute they may have and decide who should be compensated what in a place of their choosing, in a language of their choice, um, according to, uh, interpreted in accordance with, with uh, the law that, that they choose to govern their promises. Um, and now, of course, we have, uh, in the last few decades, information technology that has also started to affect uh, world trade and the ability to to do these kind of deals um, internationally. So we'll start, uh, we'll start with trying to put um, blockchain technology in this historical context. Um, it is another form of, of information technology system. Um, perhaps that's not an adequate, adequate description, um, but that's a starting point. Um, and information technology systems have brought, uh, in particular, advances in the automation of uh, performing these promises. Um, so perhaps uh, negotiating, the negotiating may well be automated. Um, algorithmic trading systems take this to an extreme. Um, but also the, the carrying out of those promises, actually performing them, um, especially in relation to uh, financial transactions or settlement. Um, so, uh, well, maybe less impact on the investment side from information technology systems. Um, so I think my, my first question for the panelists is, um, what's new here? What's, what's new about blockchain? To what extent um, uh, is, uh, does this change um, the kind of things that can go right um, with, with, with trade and, and the kind go wrong. Um, so 
Clive, I might. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Clive, I might ask you to uh, to have a few words on what can go right and what can go wrong. Well, let's begin by looking at the possibility of putting your contracts on a blockchain so that uh, software can be used to trigger an action when another event takes place. Uh, perhaps based on ascertaining a fact at a particular time. For example, the, Brent, uh, the price of Brent crude at 12 noon today. The most obvious risk of doing, putting your contract in computer software is the fact that nobody can actually, uh, a, a judge can't read the software and decide what you've agreed. There are several ways of dealing with that. One way of dealing with it would be to add comment lines to the computer software in ordinary English or some other language. But that may still be hard to understand. And there's a risk that the comment lines may not be consistent with the code that follows them. Or the comment lines may be insufficient without further explanation. A better way of dealing with it would usually be for the computer software, a computer software expert to explain how the code operates and how it amounts to an agreement in an expert's report. But again, that's adding an extra layer of complexity to the steps required to resolve a dispute if a dispute should arise. The best method of dealing with it is to supplement the smart contract with an ordinary written agreement. That, that can set out each party's rights and obligations. It can state that in the event of inconsistency, the natural language agreement should prevail, or the reverse, but that would probably be unusual. It can contain additional terms which will be important if a dispute arises, for example, dispute resolution, whether a dispute should be decided by arbitration or expert determination as opposed to by the judges in the courts, how the arbitrator should be selected in order to ensure that you do choose as your arbitrator somebody who understands the technology, whether the parties must try to reach a settlement by mediation first and the governing law that should apply, which court system should have jurisdiction in the event of disputes generally or disputes about an arbitration. So that's how you can supplement the software that contains the contract with terms and conditions that can be enforced in a court of law should that, or an arbitration, should that be necessary. Let's look at the problems that might occur Taking the example I used at the outset of action B triggered by event A or fact A, a number of problems could occur because things don't happen how they're expected to happen. First of all, the computer which is supposed to report that event A has, has occurred might fail to do so. The oracle or, or factual source which is used to determine fact A might be unavailable at the time when it's needed. Action B might not take place. Using computers without blockchains, the computer that's supposed to perform action B might be out of action or have no internet connection. But with blockchains, you've got the advantage that there isn't a single computer, but you've got multiple computers in multiple locations. So that reduces the risk that the computer performing event B won't do its job. Using smart contracts, if, if action B doesn't take place, it's likely to be because of a software error, error. And that, of course, is again a source of possible disputes. The fourth situation is that for whatever reason, action B might be performed when it should not have been performed. Or a fact, fifthly, a fact might be recorded on a blockchain which should not have been recorded on a blockchain. That point perhaps applies particularly to blockchains which are being used more as a ledger than for smart contracts or cryptocurrencies. But when I was making this list of things that could lead to disputes, I had in mind initially that these might be disputes specifically related to the use of blockchains or smart contracts as we call them. But then I found myself thinking, actually, they could all occur without blockchains. 
The first simple example is a margin call made by a commodities broker. That's been happening for decades. Uh, more recently, obviously, computers have been used to do it, but it's all been happening day to day without blockchains or smart contracts. Another example which I've been looking at recently is online platforms for selling customer invoices to investors. Nowadays, if you're a retailer that has lots of invoices that maybe are being paid in 30 days, you can upload the details of those invoices to a platform and investors can buy small proportions of those invoices to spread their risk. All that's taking place without blockchains or what we call smart contracts. In these traditional, in, in, in these contexts, at any rate where English law applies and English lawyers have got involved, there's likely to be a 20 or 30 page English language contract, which the lawyers have drafted, which hopefully provides the answer to the problem without there being a dispute. Or at the very least, if there is a dispute, tells you how the dispute should be resolved. I think the point that can be made from these examples is that if blockchains start to be used widely in international trade, we may see disputes arising from the complicated examples I've given are, uh, are happening more frequently. And there's a danger that people may be over-reliant on the smart contracts which trigger the events without spending enough time on the accompanying natural language contracts. Mm. Thank you. Any other feelings about what what might be new here? Uh, in a sense, we have here that this is something that is very much staying the same. Um, software may software may go wrong, and it's wise to. So um, I think what I would say is everything is different. Nothing is different. The idea of an automated contract, if you think about the notion of a letter of credit, uh, that is something that has been around for a long time. If an external event happens, um, you have a, an unconditional right to pay. Now, the problem, of course, with a letter of credit is bank solvency. So I had a case in, let's see, this was in 2008, and we settled a case in a very creative way, and it required funding a settlement with a letter of credit. And the plaintiff's lawyer in that case, he must have known someone or something, he, like he knew the jockey, and he insisted that we, the only bank that he would allow us to use was, I want to say it was J.P. Morgan. Um, so there's there's a problem, and I think one of the things that blockchain theoretically can solve is um, potentially credit risk. The problem that you face, though, if you rely on blockchain to solve a credit risk problem, is you still have to have an asset. Uh, you have to believe that asset is going to be worth something in the future. So to my mind, what's most interesting to me as a disputes lawyer about blockchain and what got me interested in the space is, um, as you mentioned, is the notion of... Um, Guaranteed enforceability. So I've gotten judgments against defendants, right? Basically, you had a, I had a, a client who had a lease with someone, and the person didn't pay the lease, and we sued them, pierced the corporate veil, got a personal judgment against this guy and against his company, but there was no way to collect it. So you can get a judgment uh, without being able to collect it. So theoretically, a blockchain technology can perhaps um, if not guarantee enforcement, provide a, a better um, enforceability mechanism. And that's one of the things um, that, uh, that you mentioned in your, in your introduction. One of the components of, um, of blockchain that's interesting from a contract standpoint is guaranteed enforceability. If you think about actually contract law itself, if you go back a couple thousand years, contract law itself was, it was uh, I would say, an important, if not technological innovation, but an important knowledge innovation. It was the idea that instead of relying on self-help to resolve disputes, you could rely upon state power. And I guess the question is, will blockchain be able to take contractual relationships and move enforcement away from state power to something else? I don't think we will get entirely away from state power. I think um, there are certain areas of dispute that um, we're going to have to default to court systems or to arbitrators. Um, you take... I had someone call me an insurance broker. Um, I've started to get, I can tell that this technology means something. I have 10 presentations in the next two months that were scheduled for me while I was in London. My marketing person started setting things up. 
defense contractors, insurance brokers. I get calls from people saying, um, an insurance broker two days ago, my client, big energy, uh, gas and oil company, they're doing something blockchain related. Uh, they're going to closing soon on this deal. Um, does insurance cover that? Like, what are the risks? <laughs> and so I had to explain to her what a, uh, she had heard a presentation that I had given. I had to explain to her what a fork was, right? How do you deal with fork <laughs> risk? What happens if you've got um, a smart contract that is on a blockchain and it's forked multiple times and that contract uh, can trigger payment uh, from an external bank account? How do you hedge against that? Um, so I think um, we're going to be think about how much money is um, was lost in the um, or is it frozen in parity? Was it 150 million in crypto? Maybe that all gets sorted out. But let's say you've got a billion dollars that's tied up um, in um, because of a software glitch because someone sides just because someone who has commit access to a repository they shouldn't have changes the code. It's only a matter of time before that ends up in front of a judge. Um, so I, I think um, we probably don't get completely away from state power enforcing contracts, but we move in that direction. So, so I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try it until it doesn't work anymore. Um, so I mean, I, I agree with both those comments and there's a sort of qualified a sort of qualified optimism there. Um, I'd like to highlight a point, if you like, underneath the smart contract layer, which is the ability to have trustless transactions using blockchain. And the, the paradigm for trade is that you are standing in front of someone and you give them the money and they give you the goods at the same time. <laughs> That is a trustless transaction that occurs in physical reality because we can physically transfer these things independently of any record of that taking place. The problem with international trade is that you are necessarily divorced in geography, in time, and we can assume because of that there is no trust there. And so you are trying to move uh, sometimes information but often physical items of value over time. And the techniques that we have in international trade at the moment try to replicate that trustless situation by using trusted intermediaries uh, for letters of credit, for instance, or uh, bills of lading to try and replicate the physical aspect of handing something over. What you're able to do, of course, with blockchain is to have the analog of that standing in front of someone and swapping something, but you're creating a digital record in a trustless way. On top of that, you can build smart contracts. And particularly for, for international trade, if what the record is, is itself there exists in the blockchain. You've got a complete analog of physical reality. You've got that automatic enforcement. But often what you're looking at is a record of something that physically exists. And then you have all the uh, issues that Clive pointed out. I, I, I think of them collectively as reality mismatch errors. Um, that the blockchain is absolutely correct in the record that it's created. Unfortunately, it's just reality that is at fault. Uh, and the, the, the two have in some way to be reconciled. And there, there is, and, and I think it's, sometimes it's not clear to people, there is, in fact, and so it's important to stress, there is, in fact, no way to avoid these reality mismatch errors. The underlying physical goods... Um, maybe they catch fire and disappear. Um, if the underlying physical good is a diamond, maybe someone cuts the diamond in half, so you've now got two diamonds. Um, the physical circumstances can change. Um, the other sort of reality mismatch is a problem with the event that you've created. You've said that I'm transferring this. That record exists, but perhaps that transfer is induced by a fraudulent misrepresentation. Perhaps someone's pointing a gun at your head and saying, create this record. In those cases, 
courts will reverse that transfer. In physical reality, in blockchain reality, they will do that. So although the trustless transaction is going to help with automatic enforcement and resolve a lot of disputes and save a huge amount of costs, as, as Vinay talked about initially, you are going to have these reality mismatch errors and you are going to need the, the dispute resolution that Clive talked about. Um, I'll, I'll finish with, I don't know if it's a slightly fanciful analogy, but I think of the invention of writing to go even further back. Several thousand years ago, people saying, great, finally, we can write down our agreements. Um, they'll be set out there. There'll be no problem. They'll be enforced automatically. We won't even need lawyers anymore because everything will just be written down. And so uh, <laughs> didn't quite work out like that, but, but it certainly did help. I think same with blockchain. Yes, uh, Ben is reminding me that the uh, reality mismatch error uh, is is what we often talk about as delamination. This coming apart of the uh, the uh, representation in software and the uh, the, the reality. Um, so we've heard a couple of times uh, from Clive and and from from others um, about this need for. Uh, some kind of record of uh, of the contractual agreement of the terms of an agreement in addition to a piece of software that's implementing it. I don't think there's any voice on the panel saying that you might be able to do away with that completely. Um, okay, so let's let's talk let's talk a bit about this. Um, so this this is the idea that that a lot of our work is based on um, this concept of a Ricardian contract that Ian Grigg developed originally, our chief scientist. Um, you will have a piece of software which is representing value and transfers of value. Um, but that is going to be accompanied by uh, a natural language, a written written set of terms that, that uh, describe the agreement between the parties, the agreement um, that can actually be enforced, um, the intentions that they're bound by. Um, so. Let's think about how, in in the in the context of blockchain, um, this might what this might start to look like. Um, yes, we want to do business. We want to do trade with one another. Um, we're making promises to one another. We have written agreements that that lay out what it is that we're promising to do. Um, and now we have perhaps smart contracts on blockchains or other pieces of uh, blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology um, that are automating part of the performance of these contracts, perhaps also automating uh, the enforcement of these contracts, or at least uh, automating performance in such a way that once might have to, once might have to have, would have to have been enforced, and now it doesn't, because it has been automated. Um, and yet, on the other hand, uh, you can have both uh, automated actions or uh, automated uh, states of affairs which uh, do not involve a required action, um, where the automation is is uh, generating a need for enforcement. Something has happened in an automated way, or has not happened in accordance with a piece of software, uh, and that is not in accordance with the intentions of the people who made that made that deal. Um, and now we have this issue of well, how to enforce the deal um, if the software hasn't enforced hasn't automated it. Um, but Stephen, you had a well, so the, uh, the question, um, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, you would see a, a frequent meme was um, code eats law, um, you know, code, code is law, code will get rid of lawyers. And it's, it's easy to dismiss that. And I think um, I will probably be the last buggy whip maker. Uh, I'll be around. You're going to need a trial lawyer for a while. But it's an interesting thought. It's an interesting thought experiment. Do we, contracts have not existed for all of human, for if you go back 100,000 years ago, we didn't have contracts, maybe 10,000 years ago. I don't know when the first contract was. Maybe the Phoenicians created the first contract. Uh, contracts are an artifact of trade, right? It's a way to memorialize what some, what the, what counterparties have agreed to do. But can we imagine a future in which we don't need contracts, and that would be a future in which you uh, were able to solve um, an assent uh, agreement. You were able to 
create a system that removed any that removed any possibility of disagreement about what parties intend to do. Now the problem there is that sometimes you actually, sometimes you actually um, want ambiguity in an agreement, but let's assume hypothetically there are certain agreements in which you don't want ambiguity. So if you can if you can imagine a scenario in which intent and assent or agreement can be perfectly captured, and which performance can be um, for all practical purposes um, uh, guaranteed, perhaps you don't need contracts. And perhaps you don't need people like us to go into court and to argue with a judge. So it's, I would say that remains hypothetical, but perhaps that's the, um, if you look at the horizon of blockchain technology and you look at, I don't actually like the term smart contracts because um, as a thousand other people have said, they're not, right? They're not either, but maybe in the future, um, there can be such a thing, and that thing could actually, uh, that could actually get rid of, of a contract. Maybe we won't need to have a contract. Maybe we won't need contract at all. Fanciful. Fanciful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's take the example of two cavemen. One of the cavemen has got more grain than he needs. The other caveman has got more animal skins than he needs. They meet in a cave. One hands over some grain, the other hands over some animal skins. You may say that's not a contract, but it is a contract because both of them are making an implicit promise that what they're handing over is worth having and that it's in a satisfactory condition. Let's suppose that the grain is all in a sack, and although when he puts his hand in, he takes a sample out, that looks okay, and he gives it a sniff. At the bottom of the sack, there's a whole lot of dud grain. You've got a dispute. If I could chime in on that. But not a Ricardian contract. But, but there's a difference, if I may. I mean, there's a difference between an agreement, there's a difference between an agreement and a contract and dispute. A contract presupposes enforceability by a third party. So the elements of a contract in the United States are offer, acceptance, uh, mutuality of consideration, right? So, and something that can be enforced. In that situation with the cavemen, they enforce it by hitting each other, hitting each other over the head with a stick. Um, and the innovation that law provided and that courts provided was we don't want people to hit each over the head with sticks, right? We want to have Solomon decide. It's like, okay, split the baby, right? Um, you have a neutral arbiter decide. Now the question is, and I, I will readily admit that it's a thought experiment, let's fast forward 200 years from now or 100 years from now. Is it possible to imagine, just like those cavemen could not imagine being able to go to a court and have a, have a judge decide something for them, relying on a body of, of cases and case law, um, can we imagine uh, what a system would look like where we're beyond enforceability, where, where we don't actually have to have a, a person um, decide that the agreement was enforceable? And I, it may be, I think it is fanciful right now. I don't think we have any worries about job security, but I, I wonder what that would look like. So uh, I'll hand over to Adam, Adam if you want to make a point, but uh, to your point earlier, I think the, the, the key parts here in say, the Ricardian contract concept are, yes, some software that automates something, but uh, the other part is, it's that the invention of writing. It's the clear written record of what it is that was agreed. Um, so while uh, we can most definitely have, um, uh, we can have contracts without a written record of what was agreed. Um, it may be unwise uh, because it may be rather difficult to persuade this state power that's going to enforce something against you uh, that, that that was indeed what you were, you, the other person agreed to give you. Um, so the, the question here, I think, is more precisely, um, if our automation gets good enough, would we be willing to do away with a clear written record of what we'd agreed to do. At some point, you'd still need enforcement, and that does come down to power. I mean, when the two cavemen, you know, when, when we evolved beyond the two cavemen hitting each other with sticks, well, what happened then was that they went to the village chief, 
who then you know had the entire villages worth of clubs. So at the end of the day, there is there needs to be a resource to some form of state power, decentralized group power, whatever you call it, that it, that is able to enforce the promises. So you know, I, while I do see that we may move away from the static environment of a contract that goes directly to a court, the question of a uh, dispute resolution mechanism will always need to be there. And it can be pre-agreed. We can pull up structures. We can move it away from the, the jurisdictions we're talking about. One of the things I do, uh, you know, and, and we're in the Stone Age here, right? We do this by hand. But if you do joint venture contracts in, in developing jurisdictions, one of the big questions of cooperating with Chinese companies for, uh, that comes up every time is, am I going to be able to enforce my IP? Right, I can I can get it. I get get a judgment. I can get an arbitrate arbitral award. I can bring it to China. Will I be able to enforce it? And one of the things blockchain does is to change the mindset around it. Right. So right now we do this by hand. We design the relationship in such a way that the reference to state power isn't in China. You put the IP in a joint venture entity in Hong Kong and Singapore where you can rely on the courts. Restructuring the an, entire arrangement so that you do not rely on unreliable enforcement state power in the jurisdiction, but move it somewhere else. Uh, or for that matter, uh, moving to the question of, uh, sorry, that's my train of thought there. Uh, the question of designing smart contracts and matching them to the law, my view is that you've really got to do the, those two in conjunction. The programmer will be able to develop a piece of software that automates things. Who tells the programmer how the program ought to be designed? What scenario, what treatment uh, should, uh, should the contract flow take if event A occurs? That's still a design that's being advised by the lawyers drafting the contract. So you can convert the natural language contract into code. So, uh, so you know, kind of to, you, to invert the saying, I'd say that law is code rather than code is law. In order to properly draft a contract, you do need to have a mindset of the flowchart of events A occurring leads to, leads to consequence B, which leads to consequence C, which leads to a form of possible events. That flow of work and, and thought process and uh, the understanding of the market environment and the legal conditions in each of the places where you're operating is necessary in order to develop the software in the first place. Hmm. So this, this is a, another interesting angle. Um, and matches our own experience with in, in initial work with clients that the legal input in some ways is about uh, design. It's it's designing the the relationship and the the the, the, the space of possibility um, in which events might unfold. Um, what constraints do we wish to place on how things may may play out? Um, and what what the what the automation that you can have with smart contracts adds to it is that it's not simply about uh, saying, well, here's our preferred path forward. You do exactly what you promised. I get exactly what you promised to pay me. Great. Um, but we're also designing in non-preferred paths through the system. It's starting to scenario plan and figure out various things that may happen. Um, and to some extent, those can then be um, considered in advance rather than as a surprise. Uh, and to some extent, the appropriate responses, if something isn't quite right, can be can be programmed in, can be designed in. So the there's it, it's something that ought to have always happened. Uh, lawyers always should have been, um, but probably didn't have the opportunity to. Um, and I, I won't explore where the incentives might lie, but didn't have the opportunity to uh, um, design business arrangements in such a way um, that a dispute was less likely to arise in the first place because something had been anticipated and provided for in the contract. If I may, so one of the reasons I'm not too worried about job security is I think... Um, you scratch a law firm now, and you'll find a, you'll find um, they've got an innovation lab or somebody who's talking about lawyers learning how to code. I, I actually, as long as we exist in um, countries or jurisdictions where there are laws, there will be a need for lawyers to provide input, and ultimately, lawyers are going to learn how to how to program. 
So a future lawyer, you might not have people who go to court, which is sad because going to court is fun. Um, <laughs> juries are awesome. Um, you don't have civil juries in England. That it's, uh, they probably don't make any sense, but it's a tremendous, it's, it's great fun. But I think our jobs uh, will morph, and um, there's something about law um, and design that's very, very interesting. I think we'll see uh, more and more of that. You know, maybe eventually it's like Herman Hess and it's like the glass bead game and we move beyond law into um, some sort of existence where we, we play complex mathematical games all day. I don't, I don't see that happening anytime soon. So as long as we have law, we'll definitely have to have um, designers who have legal training or, or uh, lawyers who have um, uh, design training. Steve, I've never been to court, so unfortunately it's not, not an exciting uh, life that I lead. But um, Chris, to, to your point, uh, law today, contract drafting today, is exactly like programming. and it's, it's an iterative process. Each time Steve thinks up some new loophole that the contract does not cover, the next, the next round we negotiate a contract has a new clause that matches that. So, you know, we're bug fixing. That's, yeah, and I, I, don't, I don't see that the shift to coding is going to change that work away from lawyers. Yeah, it changes what we do. So there's someone here from Etherisk. I see you in the back. Um, so I don't know if folks know about this company, but what, they, what Etherisk has done is it's one of the, um, one of the very few uh, production blockchain applications that does something. And I think it's basically Ricardian in nature. What, what Etherisk does is it guarantees it's a flight insurance application, single trigger. If your flight is late, like you go to a website, you pay. Um, if your flight is late, you get paid automatically. Now I'm an insurance coverage lawyer. I sue insurance companies for a living. And often that's because insurance companies, it's shocking, they don't pay. Where's Lloyd's from here? Which direction that way? Hello, Lloyd's. It's Pally, I'm here. Um, but, um, what that does is that gets rid of certain kinds of disputes, but it probably, A, you need to have lawyers provide input into the design, into the construction. Also, what's interesting about Etherisk is they actually have an insurance policy. So it's Ricardian in that there is actually an insurance policy written by, it's a Maltese insurance company. Is that right? There you go. See, memory. It's an insurance policy written by a Maltese insurer. It's some sort of actual insurance company. So you've got the paper component. And then you've got the payment automation piece. Um, so what that will do, the, the trajectory there is you need to have lawyers involved in, you still need folks involved in creating the contracts, but you end up sh moving certain things away from um, disputes. It's very interesting. I think you'll see hopefully more um, applications moving in that direction. I, I, I can't resist uh, saying that, I mean, We've had this code is law. Um, I think I think we're missing something there. Code is just code. Law is systems design. There isn't just one uh, kind of practice of of software engineering. Um, there's there are there are different kind of scales or uh, levels at which you can you can carry out that kind of task. Um, so I don't think lawyers of the future will necessarily be coding. But they might well be uh, designing the architecture of systems, which uh, some people then do indeed then go and write up in code. I, mean, I, I think we've maybe morphed slightly from the future of law to the future of lawyers, which is of great importance to everyone on the panel. Uh, and we, <laughs> we could talk about it for a long time. Um, <laughs> but I mean, to, to your point about the, uh, you said it's important to, to view that hypothetical of. The, the code and just the code, whether it's the lawyers doing it or, or not. And um, I, I, I think where it's important, or where, where it may become important, is for a lot of contracts and a lot of international trade are in fact right now not enforceable, in the sense that it is simply not worth it for the people doing the trade to enforce the contract. If you're buying something worth £100 from China, you will very quickly find out that the costs of, of trying to complain and, and obtain legal recourse, it is simply not worthwhile. So there is a huge mass of, of unlawyered, effectively unenforceable contracts in the international trade space. 
And where, where we talk about this code creeping up um, and trying to, to cover the most common situations, that may well be where it enables international trade to flourish and slowly moves its way up the value chain. Um, and yes, the larger disputes will remain the same, but I think it can still be very important. Um, uh, but I think that, that means that we don't need the law even going up the value chain, I'm not sure that that is dead. Well, we, we, we think it is maybe as lawyers up here, uh, but I'd be interested to hear contrary views if there are any in the audience. Mm. Sure, let's, let's have the question, and then we can come back. It's coming, it's coming. It seems to me that the, 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 the other key aspect to to, to any of this working is is something that I think is inescapable, which is consent. Uh, like I don't think you can ever have anything that's truly trustless, because the trust simply moves because both parties still have to consent to take part in the uh, in, and be subject to the contract, whether it happens digitally or not. So at that point, trust becomes I trust this person because they've consented to agree to these terms. And I think you can never remove that. And, and lack of trust means they don't want to play by these rules. So, uh, so, so you know, you, you're going to be wary of, of doing business with them if they, if they seem to be uh, unwilling to, to play the game, to participate. Yeah. Um, so, so, so at that point, uh, trust simply becomes generated by the, the consent and the willingness to engage in and, and participate in the, the, the contract, whether it happens in meat space or whether it happens digitally. Mm. Mm. Let's not drop this point about the, just how much of uh, trade today is not enforceable, not practically enforceable, um, and how much trade is potentially not happening, uh, because if it if you were to try and do a deal of that nature, it would not be practically enforceable. Is it related to this, or is it a separate question? It's related, okay, let's, let's have this question. Brilliant. Uh, loved Chu's comment about the clubs and the pooling of clubs, the village elder. Uh, my take on it is humans have two mechanisms of enforcement, violence and discretion. Legal systems make use of violence. It's a pooled violence, it's according to processes, et cetera, but it's still violence. We also use discretion. And one of the wonderful demonstrations of a discretion-based system working in contexts where the legal system does not operate for the very reason that just got brought up is eBay and ratings systems. These are systems that have enforcement that has to do with your opportunity to interact with future parties. And whether that opportunity gets altered based on how you show up this time. So I think that, that if there is a threat mm. to law, it's the rise of a more functional discretion-based system. Uh, and, and it doesn't necessarily mean law goes away entirely, but it may shift significantly. So let me just speak to that first, because I think that's a very important point. Um, I do think we need to draw a distinction here between uh, Kind of the consumer level, retail, and and kind of business to business, like trade trade at slightly higher values. Um, I mean, for one, uh, we lose the possibility of using escrow when we go to kind of world trade. Um, there's always going to be that opportunity to tie some. Why did you? Say Why did you yeah. Uh, because I don't see that. Uh, if you're running supply chains where liquidity is at a premium, you can afford to tie up significant chunks of cash, um, quite the opposite. Um, I would say in this context, enforceable legal contracts are a form of trade finance. They precisely allow you to avoid having to tie up um, a big chunk of, of, of operating capital in escrow. So, sure, and those are um, mechanisms that come with, with enforceability that comes with contracts. Those so, Chris, it's, if yes. I could chime in. Um, yeah. Actually, I, I, you know, I kind of agree with Steve there. I'm actually working with, uh, with a team that's looking to build a trade finance, a blockchain trade finance platform for Africa. And that's, you know, that's a space where uh, the, the, uh, the current estimates are hundreds of billions of unmet trade finance needs 
because the legal systems are not, it, it's a systems design question, right? The legal systems are such that enforcement is pretty much un, in, in, impossible on the ground in Africa. You, know, you have security over the asset, but there's no way to, uh, there's no way to enforce that security. So there, there are ways to design a system where you are taking escrow, you're taking a, say, a crypto token escrow in lieu of a letter of credit, reducing transaction costs, uh, structuring the, uh, stru the system, as, as you mentioned, systems design, you're thinking through how the platform works, uh, how, the, uh, how, how the incentives run, such that it does become legally enforceable in a jurisdiction where you can rely on the state power. Uh, in terms of kind of a B2B and B2C differential, I'm not sure that uh, you know the reputation scores on eBay are any different from credit ratings. The word trustless has always bothered me, actually. So basically, my I think I came up with this. It, trust didn't go away; it just moved. What, what you're doing fundamentally is you're moving trust to Vitalik Buterin, right, and to a four-year-old experimental blockchain. Um, so it's, it's not that these systems are, I think what it means is you're, you're moving the trust between counterparties to trust to, uh, brilliant uh, uh, programmers um, in a system that doesn't really have an established governance. So it's not, you're just, you're taking one set of problems and potentially creating another one. I'm very bullish um, on blockchain, incidentally. It's not a criticism, it's just a practical reality of where we are. Well, Steve, I would say the purpose of trustless is to move the trust to someone who doesn't have an incentive in the system. So if you, if, 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 if we're doing a trade together, uh, if I need to trust you, you have an embedded interest in the system. But if we trust the judge, then he's got no particular stake one way or another. So that, that kind of is, is, is the extent of moving things away from the need to trust counterparties in the system and move it to a reliable source, whether that reliable source is the group at large, so that there's a consensus algorithm, or whether as cur in current times, we use state power and appeal to courts. I mean, I kind of like a court more than I like the EIP um, situation right now. That, that's my point is, it's not trustless. You're trusting people who you don't know who do have it. They have a financial interest in the value of a cryptocurrency. Um, in the, uh, you're also trusting miners. It's not. It, it's what I try and explain to clients who are going into these things is. Um, you you really are, you're taking one set of trust problems and potentially creating another, which isn't a bad thing. It's just a question of looking at it with both eyes open. I mean, to put in a word for uh, the sort of legal tradition, I think the, uh, the fact that you have, at least in some jurisdictions, those relatively neutral third party institutions, the courts, um, that can be relied upon is, it's, it's, it's a, a major service. I, I think tr trust has come up a, a few times in trustlessness, and I sort of put it front and center at the start. Uh, I, I mean, it, I, I think it's, it is obviously you're moving the trust. You're moving it to a sort of collective endeavor, and it depends which blockchain exactly. Um, but, but I think there is still more to it, and there is still a, a genuine trustlessness that you've created. We could debate exactly how that works or exactly where you've moved it to. Maybe that's a bit technical. But to, to pick up on the, or just on the reputation side, um, the, the sort of the reputation remedy, if you like, is complementary to the trustless nature of blockchain. Uh, you don't need blockchain to have a reputation system. And a reputation system can, can replace that if you can't achieve trustlessness. Perhaps the analog for the reputation type remedies within the blockchain system is the ability to exclude bad players as a punishment for breaking the rules. So a type of enforcement which can be done, if you like, without recourse to the legal system, where you say you are no longer allowed to transact on this blockchain, you are excluded from it in some way. That can be uh, very powerful. That can be done internally to the blockchain. Um, it raises lots of other issues when you're dealing with multilateral as opposed to bilateral uh, situations. So you've now got more than two people involved. You have the whole system involved. How do you uh, obtain consent to that? How does that work? 
Um, I, I think those sorts of remedies will be important in, in future blockchain systems. Would you prefer a neutral independent party or would you prefer a popularity contest? But uh, we, we did have a question at the, at the back. Yeah. So I'm international oil and gas board by trade. I've worked in the Foster areas for years. Um, and so what confuses me in terms of this contract is the enforceability. I understand binary one-off payments, um, you know, options, features, all of that. But how does it work in a more complex contract? You mentioned IP rights and you know, enforceability. So what, what's the point of me having an, an IP right if I can't, within the code of the contract, ensure that you know, the PRC will enforce in uh, Shanghai my rights? So like, it, it, it's that break with the reality that I, I, can you please speak to that is my question. Yes, thank you. I think that's one of the most important points we can make this afternoon. Um, yes, there will be things that we can fully automate. Uh, if I'm going to sell you some Ether and you're going to send me some Bitcoin, um, those are kind of digital assets and the actions can happen immediately. <clears throat> if, if I'm supposed to have the right to receive some oil physically from some location for a period of time, um, it doesn't really matter what any software system says if I stop receiving my oil from that location. So the distinction I make is between um, right single trigger payment where you're relying on a trusted data source. I don't like Oracle because an or Oracles are the opposite of what they, the word means the opposite of what people intend. That's one thing. But the question is so how do you automate performance using a smart contract? So I think it's actually some fairly complex automation is possible. Let's take, uh, do people know what a quantity takeoff is in construction? Uh, quantity takeoff is um, when you're doing excavation, um, you have to pay, um, you've got to pay for the cost of the amount of dirt that you remove. And one of the most common disputes in American construction projects is the amount uh, of the quantity takeoff. How do you figure that out? Do you weigh the soil? Do you eyeball it? So how would you automate that? I thought about this. I did a presentation for the ABA three years ago. We brought a drone in. Nobody showed up. I actually talked about Ethereum, and I spelled it wrong. Um, I used an I. I'm still kind of embarrassed in my white paper half years ago. So what we discovered was you can actually automate uh, something that seems very performance-related, a quantity takeoff, and you would use a drone that uses photogrammetry to... Uh, look at the earth, measure the amount of soil that's removed. You can do that actually more precisely using technology than you can using a scale, uh, which has to deal with variable uh, weight of a truck. Um, you can, the drone can then send that information to a smart contract, which can then automate payment. I think if you, the, the problem with trying to drain the ocean at once is it becomes impossible to look at. You have to think about it from an iterative uh, standpoint. So what I would do in your situation is, take the most complex performance um, issue that you have and then work, you know, it's something you want to try and automate, speak with programmers, talk, basically you break it into the smallest possible pieces. So with construction, which is one of the things that I focus on, I would begin with excavation, quantity takeoff, and then you look at uh, things that are more complicated. How do you figure out if the mill work was installed per plan, per spec, and done on time? Can you automate that? And I think what you find is if you break things down into their component pieces, you can actually begin to automate fairly complex uh, performance requirements as well. I, I think my follow-on to that, and then we'll come to your question, uh, is consequential damages, I mean consequential loss. This is the thing. I mean, it's one thing to have a contract where we can automate <coughs> enforcement. We can take something that would have perhaps required enforcement action. You've delivered short your uh, and will reduce the payment accordingly. That that no longer needs to be enforced because because that that's now a non preferred pathway system that can be automated. Um, but if if you knew full well that I needed that that delivery from you because a whole lo series of other things depended on it, um, it's going to be potentially what what I owe you uh, to make good for my breaking my promise um, is more than you were ever going to pay me had I delivered. And this is, and in these kind of contexts, um, it's hard to see how any kind of escrowing solution can work. Yeah, we're back, it's back to... Just on a limitation of liability 
Okay, but I think that's an interesting question. What economy look like when uh, nobody nobody can get consequential loss? No one can get consequential loss. Yeah. Uh, we can, as long as they're not penal. Um, so, I mean, this seems like this is where we get into this very kind of fu uh, fuzzy middle ground where uh, reputation, insurance, and escrow all begin to interconnect to each other. So network escrow, trade associations, uh, you know, various ways of doing long-term accountability. Um, it seems like we've seen over many different technological substrates, many different ways of approaching those problems. Uh, David Friedman's Machinery of Freedom illustrates a whole bunch of examples. Uh, I tend to uh, think that in, uh, reputation systems are very fragile. Uh, I much prefer things like insurance and escrow. But um, is there any work, does anybody know of any work that looks on these things uh, on a spectrum, on a network that has some kind of nomenclature and analysis of how we move systems from uh, an escrow norm to an insurance norm, for example? There must be academic work on it. I just don't know where you would find it. That might be a question for the audience as much as the panel. Insurance, they're, they're... Escrow and insurance or bonding in the United States, they're different things. Escrow is a payment guarantee. Um, it's a two-party payment guarantee. Insurance is um, contingent risk. Um, you pay a premium to a third party, so you're, you're pooling the asset. I don't know that you would necessarily ever move entirely from escrow to insurance or from insurance to escrow. I think they serve... An, Somebody has a different opinion. You know, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think they fundamentally they're different relationships. One is tripart, uh, the other is probably um, what's it's, it's two party, um, and I think they serve different risk functions. But I don't know. Well, certainly from the buyer standpoint, they they serve one and the same thing, which is you know I want to get paid. Whether it's whether it's through an escrow, whether it's from insurance, whether it's from a, offloading the, uh, the 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 asset to a third party market. I just want to get paid. So as long as as long as the system designs correctly for the for uh, for the result that I need, uh, the mechanism as as a as a as a participant in the system is is frankly relevant. Mm -hmm. And so you do see um, kind of in the M and A context, for instance, you will see it. Is, it's been an increasing market for um, for insurance over breach of reps, reps and warranties. You'd think that that'd be the most absurd thing in the world, but there's a market for it because it's priceable. And so, you know, where it's priceable, there's a deal to be done. Yeah. We have another question. Uh, do we have the rooming mic? Oh, no, so I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. you've been waiting in the queue for a long time. Yeah. Please. So, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so excuse me for a, a, maybe a, a slightly basic question. But I get extremely upset when, when people talk about trustless trust without actually defining what it means. and. People like Chris Dixon of uh, and recent Horowitz recently published a an hour long podcast where he at least mentioned trustless trust fifty times, saying it's going to change everything without actually specifying once what does it change. And as a as a kind of ex banker, when when I look at trustless trust, these types of contracts or agreements simply look to me as fully collateralized agreements. And, and that's actually, I mean, in, in the context of things like B2B or especially uh, trade financing, and that's, that's why banks came into existence, to provide trust into contracts where otherwise you would need huge amounts of collateral. So could you, in a way, help clarify that from your perspective, does trust this trust actually mean anything? And specifically, does it lead to disintermediation of the kind of the framework otherwise surrounding these contracts? Excellent question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we, we brought up trustlessness at the start, and it is in, important. And um, we're not in a sort of nihilistic worldview where there is no trust in anything. To, to, to go to go back to the, the the first example of swapping the goods for the money, there is a trust there. There is a trust in the fiat currency that you're handing over a trust that that system uh, exists uh, and that that currency has value. Um, and and um, it, it, you, you can, I think, sort of go down the rabbit, 
trying trying to locate where this trust has moved to, um, it, it is in some sense moved to a collective system. But I'm I'm slightly reluctant to go more into that just because you can spend hours looking at podcasts. And I wonder if we could if we could stipulate here that the trust has moved so that as you said you are able to disintermediate um, without getting into a, a sort of theological debate as to the, the nature of that trustlessness. Would that help? There was a question here and then one at oh, the back. Sorry, so sort of picking up on that point, maybe I have a slightly challenging view for you guys, which is that actually as a lawyer, um, you learn eventually or quickly that contracts are really about relationships and most contracts aren't actually enforced and they're certainly not enforced in accordance with their terms. And I think there's a lot of anthropological evidence that suggests that societies have prospered most where there's not just been the ability to trade, but there's been trust. And I think this idea of trustlessness as a goal is beyond payment and cryptocurrency. It's not necessarily a good thing. Um, the legal systems which have proved most useful for trade are Anglo-Saxon legal systems, not civil law legal systems. And Anglo-Saxon legal systems have always baked in discretion. You aren't held to your promises. Um, that's why you don't have specific performance. You have damages as a remedy. That's why there are equitable remedies like estoppel. Um, and the fact that you won't necessarily be held to your performance is actually part of what builds the trust in the relationship. You people have to be almost able to not perform or decide not to perform, and that builds the trust. So I'm not convinced that having, you know, using blockchain technology um, is necessarily a good in its, in it, on its own just because it enables trustlessness. I think we want to encourage trust between people, not make them feel that the world would be better if they could trade trustlessly. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you. Uh, I think one of the nice applications of blockchain technology in a Ricardian contract is, is, is supporting this. Um, you can, well, trust but verify might be the, uh, might be the, might be the, the right that, slogan. Uh, so you can, you can use a blockchain, say, over the... So if you've scenario planned, if you've actually done a bit of design about the kind of relationship you want, and you have an idea about what's going to happen and when, and what kinds of evidence there would be of performance as, as, this, as this contractual performance unfolds, you can take those pieces of evidence. You can hash them. You can put the hashes on a blockchain. Um, that's a really nice way of, no, of make, ensuring that everyone knows that if there were to be a dispute, um, any neutral coming in to resolve it is going to have a nice chronology and it's going to be very difficult to uh, resolve from those you know, notices that were sent and you don't even need a... It's not about dispute, though, is it? It's about, it's about relationships. The world changes. People decide to do things in different ways and contract is kind of a, a background or how you have that relationship. It's not, in the real world, it's not this person can do this, gets enforced. It's more, well, okay, what's the reason? How can I help you? What are we going to do about that? That's how business really works. You know, I, I would have to disagree with that, actually, as a systems design question, because the, the um, trust has a scaling problem, right? You can trust the people you know, you trust the immediate people you trade with. You can trust long-term, you can discover whether or not you can trust a long-term partner. But when you buy a random object, a random item that you want off eBay, you're trusting eBay because you have the relationship. You're not trusting the seller because you don't know the seller from Jack. And so a system that allows the shifting of trust uh, to a mechanism that, that you can build a one-on-one -on -one connection with enables global trade that, you know, without which we'd all just be trading with our nearest five neighbors. Same thing with insurance policies. I mean, um, I've been dealing with insurance companies for 20 years, and uh, insurance companies don't treat everybody the same way. And this is maybe more of a, this is, I, I like, in, it, all insurance companies aren't all bad. Uh, we need them in order to operate. Um, but um, there's a different relationship there than you have between um, 
maybe two commercial entities who are doing business, maybe a, a developer and a contractor. But I go back to my example of the quantity takeoff automation. I think that that can help build trust. It, like, it removes one of the areas of dispute that you can possibly have and facilitates maybe a stronger relationship. So where there are those moments where you do need discretion, where you say, well, you know, I know I don't really owe you $100,000. Um, maybe you take 50 and I'll throw the next job to you. You're right. That is partly how business gets done. You've got the contract. But if you want to, if you want to maintain uh, a mercantile relationship, sometimes discretion is the thing that that allows um, uh, business to proceed. I mean, not only are, are most contracts not enforced, most contracts are never actually read. Uh, usually, <laughs> usually when we have a dispute, uh, they bring out the, the thousand pages of contractual documentation from a drawer where they've been gathering dust and no one has actually looked at them or conducted their relationship in accordance with that contract. Uh, and no one looked at it until there was actually a dispute. So yeah, there's certainly some truth to that. I, I would just say I think it's important to distinguish the, the ability to create a record um, let's say to, to, to know what's in a bank account without having to trust a third party bank. To, to have those records in the same way that you can transfer something to someone when you meet them face to face. It's important to distinguish that and to recognize that advance um, from the trust in the underlying relationship. We're, we're not advocating a lack of trust there. We're just adding some new things that can be done that seem particularly relevant for international trade where you are separated by geography and language and time uh, and in a different sort of trust arena um, but how it will work i think depends the factors that you that you bring up we we have a question at the back who's been waiting for a while leading member of the vine fan club <laughs> uh, and Dominic, my co-director next to him, not to exclude you, his fan club too. Um, this is really for Mr. Pally, I think. I, I, I'm, I, I, I was an American, an international lawyer. I, I don't practice anymore. I went into financial services and fintech some time ago. Uh, but when I was a lawyer, I wrote a professional. Um, I'm, I'm conscious, having lived here for many years, that everything we're talking about is in the context, really, of the UK or other countries. So when what we're talking about today, Materium Internet of Agreements, is resolved, that will be, uh, uh, that will be the situation, the law in a nation state. It'll be the law of the land. Not so in the states. And that's what I'd like to ask you about. Years ago, um, I wrote a professional law review paper, which somehow became the leading authority for something like 10 years on international letters of credit. And um, People asked me to be part of a working group, and we put together something very similar to what's being done here. But despite the Uniform Commercial Code, you're smiling already, the 50 states, by the time they were through, tore it to pieces, and there absolutely was no uniformity of anything. So whatever this august body comes up with in time will be the law in the UK, in France, in Estonia, in wherever. But please, tell us what happens when it gets to the United States. So the United States is not unique in having a federal system, um, but it does create, um, you can say that it, I mean, it creates opportunities, but it's complex. So we have every state um, has its own legislature and uh, has control over certain bodies of law. So contract law, for the most part in the United States, is a matter of state law and what what uh, the law is in Utah about contract law isn't necessarily what the law is in Idaho. It's particularly nettlesome for insurance because of something called, um, oh, it's not, it's, uh, there's a, a statute that basically says that insurance is regulated by the state. So every single state in the United States has its own insurance commissioner. Um, and if you want to be an insurance company in the United States, you can't, unless you are in the, um, unless you're a certain type of health insurer, um, you can't write insurance for the entire country. So if, if um, you want to write insurance policies, like I don't know if folks know about Lemonade, it's an interesting insurance company uh, that's launched in the U.S. Um, they've got a um, very famous behavioral scientist is uh, involved in it, but um, they had to start in New York. So I, I think you're right. What happens in one state in the United States doesn't necessarily happen everywhere else. You can have unless there is um, unless Congress takes something away from the states, and that's not challenged by the Supreme Court. 
we don't have the same national uniformity. Um, so, did that answer the question? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think you'll have to ask him afterwards, I'm afraid. We're, very, we're just running out of time, uh, and I'm sorry for the others who had questions. Um, the, the final comment should be, though, I mean, let's, in, with all this talk of fragmentation, let's not forget the wonders of arbitration. Um, this is about world trade. It is rather wonderful that you can uh, choose your law and specify the kind of expertise you want your arbitrator to have and have somebody competent decide what it was that you agreed and what damages who should pay to whom um, based on a law that you expected to be applied um, by someone with the relevant skills. It's arbitration is a wonderful thing. Thank you very much to my panelists. That was, uh, that was a, I hope you'll agree, a very interesting session. And let's, uh, let's give the panelists a round of applause, please. <laughs>